All right, guys, welcome back to lesson 28. Here we are, second lesson, plowing through the book of Exodus. Now, here's the cool thing. We have one theme, one word for the whole book, 40 chapters in Exodus. All right, guys, let's see if we can deliver er. Is that right? This is our theme word for the entire book of Exodus. Now, in Genesis, it was seed, how the seed of the woman carries on all the way to the seed of Christ. Now, here we have in the book of Exodus, deliverer. So when we asked my cousin Mindy to paint, uh, this is her painting for the book of Exodus. It's just awesome how the Lord's going to deliver us. Think about this through the lamb. He's going to deliver us through the staff. He's going to deliver us through the, the hyssop and the oil and, and through the sky. We're going to see how this all unpacks every single lesson. And yet today we get to talk about Moses. Now think about this. Kevin made a great point. Moses is the one who wrote the Pentateuch, Exodus, the first five books of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And now we get to hear straight from Moses' mouth all about his own life. No longer just about Jacob and the tribes or Abraham and Isaac, but he's going to be writing about himself. And so in Exodus 1, you have this fun backdrop of the Hebrew wives. And I, I wish we would have said this earlier in yesterday's lesson. I think it's an incredible point that Kevin pointed out. Kevin's on a roll, just for the record. You know, the Hebrew wives really served as a deliverer. The Hebrew wives, the midwives, were the ones who said, we're not going to because we fear God. You know, I know we said they're heroes, heroines, but they're also deliverers. They're, they're not going to uh, subject the sons into the Nile River. They're not going to subject the sons in killing them. They said, no way. And because of that, God honored them. And in fact, it says they feared God. And the scripture continues on to the next verse of Exodus 1. It says, since they feared God, in verse 21, he gave them families. And so here you have this transition in Exodus 1 to Exodus 2. It says now in verse 1 of Exodus 2, a man from the family of Levi. Now remember this, you guys. The king of Egypt is irate. He is tired of the Israelites. He's tired of their people. They keep having kids. So every son that's now born, they are going to, okay, what they're going to do is, is all of the sons of the Hebrews, they're thrown into the Nile River. Just literally just throw them. Like, like there's no worth or anything to them. And so it says in verse 1, Now a man from the family of Levi married a Levite woman. So here you have Amram and Jochebed. A-M-R-A-M. -A -M. Amram, 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 and Jochebed. It says they marry each other. And it continues on in verse 2. The woman became pregnant. Jochebed became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was beautiful, she, she hid him for three months. And so then in verse 3, I, here's the deal. I'm going to want to teach on this. I'm going to give a summary here of this, okay? <laughs> is that what she does is that she gets a basket, a papyrus, 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 papyrus basket. She coated it with asphalt and pitch, and then she took, she took the baby, the child, and she put him in the, in the Nile River. Now, what's interesting to me about doing this is in some way, she was actually obedient to what the king of Egypt actually said. All male sons are supposed to be thrown into the Nile River. She just happened to add some things <laughs> to help her child survive in the Nile. And so the scripture just continues to unfold the story. In verse 5, Pharaoh's daughter, she went to, uh, she went to bathe and, and she finds this, this little basket in the reeds and she sends a servant uh, to get him. And then in verse 7, what do you know? There's a, there's a baby. Uh, the baby's sister is planted there. Don't you love how God works? They're, they're a strategic team. And the baby sisters say, hey, should I go call a woman from the Hebrews to nurse the boy who's found in this basket for you? And it's just like they automatically planted this. And then in verse 9, you have, well, yeah, that's a great idea. In fact, let's pay the mom, let's pay the woman to nurse the little boy who put him in the river. I'm telling you, it's a smart family, this Amram and Jochebed. Now, you know, just so you know, the, the older sister of this little boy is Miriam. And Miriam, and then the older boy has a, a, a brother named Aaron. So you have Miriam. Aaron, and then you're going to find out who this little boy is. And you know, it's cool because Moses is writing about his family. And I love how he unfolds this story. And in verse 10, what do they call him? They call him Moses. Why? It says because he's been drawn out. Moses means there's multiple conversations about what the name Moses could, could mean. But one of them is, I drew him out of the, the water. I drew him out of the Nile. I'm just going to tell you now, I think that's one of the most prophetic names. You think about this. Think about all of his stories. Moses' life revolves around water and wilderness. And I think it's cool because when he goes into the Red Sea, it just, I drew him out of the water. 
There's so many cool pictures here about Moses serving as the deliverer for the people. And it started with him being in a basket that Pharaoh's daughter found. And now his own mom is getting paid to nurse him. And God is just setting up the stage. And then what happens is, is that in verse 11, things continue to grow in Exodus 2. And years later, after Moses had grown up and he went out to take care of it and look at his people, and he observed their forced labor. Remember this, you guys, that when Jacob and all of their descendants came, the king of Egypt became so furious as that they have multiplied and they have become fruitful that he forced them into slavery. And he began to notice the Hebrew people, his own people. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. And he, so I think it's interesting that he identified with that Hebrew. And then in verse 12, it gets really messy. Uh, Moses then actually struck the Egyptian dead and hit him in the sand. And then there's this verse 14 and 15. Uh, he, uh, people found out Moses became afraid. Pharaoh actually then wanted to kill Moses. And then in this process... He flees. You go from being drawn out of the water. Years later, he's grown up. He sees his own people going into the slavery, being slaved and going into the oppression. That, and then it says he flees. And then verse 16 through 20, he's on a journey. And as he's on a journey, he finds these seven daughters. They come to draw water. And the next thing you know, after he spares them and helps feed and take care of their animals, uh, uh, what do you know? He's invited to dinner. So there's a lot in Exodus 2 and I'm like, oh my goodness, Lord, how do you focus on just Exodus 2 and then not 3? Or how do you not focus on Exodus 2 and focus on 3? But this is part of our daily reading. So I just want to make sure you get the, the overall picture. So then in verse 21 of Exodus 2, Moses agrees to stay with the man. Eventually he gives his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Moses then and his, and his wife, they end up having a son named Gershom. Kershom, it means stranger, or I've been a, a, a foreigner in a foreign land. And so I feel like I've been a stranger in a land. That's what he names his son. This is the backdrop to all that's been taking place. Holy cow, what an incredible chapter about what is taking place. And now this is where we're going to jump in, you guys. At the end of Exodus 2, verse 23. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. Remember, this is the one who wanted to implement all of the sons need to be thrown into the Nile River, all the Hebrew sons. And the Israelites, they groaned because of the difficult labor. They cried out and their cry for help ascended to God because of the difficult labor. In verse 24, scripture continues. So God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In verse 25, God saw the Israelites and he took notice. All right, so here you have the death of an Egyptian king. Kevin, if you can, go back to 23. Pharaoh it was probably more than likely Thutmose III, okay? When you do the study, it's like, who is which one? Thutmose who? Which king is he? Which Pharaoh is he? So once this guy dies, the Israelites, they're constantly crying out. They're constantly saying, okay, what does this look like? We're tired of this. And it's cool because it says God heard and God saw. Now, when I look at this text, it doesn't to me say they got on their knees and they prayed. It doesn't mean that they fasted. Like, I don't see anything spiritual. All I know is that their cry for help actually ascended to God because he recognized their labor. So, Kevin, if you can go to Numbers 20, verse 16. Go to Numbers 20, verse 16. And, and what you're going to see is, is uh, actual proof that they cried out to the Lord. It says, when we cried out to the Lord, he heard our voice sent an angel and brought us out of Egypt. So here's one reference. When they cried out, they were actually crying out to the Lord. One other reference in Deuteronomy 26, verse 7. I know that in 23, 24, and 25, it doesn't look like they're crying out to the Lord. But it says in 26, 7, So we called out to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the, the Lord heard our cry. He saw our misery, hardship, and oppression. You know, I'm just going to tell you, there are times in my life where I have just literally cried out and I haven't said God. I haven't. I've been like, what in the world am I doing? Like, why am I going through this? Like, have you ever, I don't know, have you guys ever just gone non-spiritual for a second? No. <laughs> I kind of think that's what's happening. Like, they're so tired of the work. They're so tired of the labor. They're just venting out loud. But God knows their heart. These are his people and God recognizes his people. And because of that, it says he heard our cry. He saw our misery and God is going to do something about this. And in fact, Warren Wearsby, he says this. He sees our plight, feeds our sorrows and remembers his covenant. What he promised, he will perform. 
for he never breaks his covenant with his people. When the right time comes, God goes to work. And I love this image because, yes, Kevin, how long? How long is, is the, have they been going through this junk? 400 plus years. 400 plus years. I think it would be worth crying out and groaning. Dear Lord, how many more brick and mortar can I work with? How much more concrete do I have to deal with? And so I think there's this constant, like, they're just crying out and crying out. But remember, 14 times all throughout the Old Testament, God remembers his covenant. He doesn't forget what he's promised. In fact, Psalm 105, verse 8, Kevin, if you'll go there. Psalm 105, verse 8, he reiterates what God remembers. He remembers his covenant, how often? Forever. The promise he ordained for a thousand generations. I'm telling you guys, even though 400 plus years of slavery, God's not done with his people. And can I just tell you this? Yes, there's periods of time that God wants to speak through us. Yes, there's a period of time he wants to speak into the church. But I, can I just tell you, his covenant is still with his, his people, the Israelites. His covenant is forever. It doesn't stop and then just come to the church. You guys, it has to stay with the Israelites. It has to. It says it's forever. Forever means actually forever. Crazy enough, in Luke, Luke 1, Zechariah is talking about this as well. Luke 1, verse 72. You're going to see, talking about the Lord, He remembers. He doesn't forget. He says, He has dealt mercifully with our fathers, and He remembered His holy covenant. What I love about this is that God hears the groaning, and He remembers what He promised Abraham in Genesis 12. He remembers what He promised Isaac and Jacob. He remembers these things. He took notice, and so He decides to actually do something about it. I actually believe you and I can play a role in gently reminding the Lord, Hey, Lord, do you remember what you've told me? Do you remember what you've, you revealed to me? Lord, do you remember I'm here? God wants us to talk to Him. I love when Maya, Nadia, and Salem and Jude come talk to me. I love it. It's not that I stop loving them. It just reminds me, oh yeah, this is. Does that make sense? I think as, as parents, it's not that we've ever stopped loving them, but we need, God doesn't need it. I get that. But we need those reminders. And I think sometimes it's an expression of us just saying, God, we're here. And so, and then there's all of a sudden this, this, this crazy weird shift. And so in Exodus 3, verse 1, God hears the Israelites. He realizes something's going to change. And meanwhile, Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. There, there is Jethro. Now, we remember in Exodus 2, we were talking about in verse 18, Ruel, R-E-U-L, was the name. Some people actually think Jethro is the name of the priest. It's the same person, but that's his priest's name. It's just a thought. So I don't want you to get confused. You're like, hey, I thought this was him, and I thought was this him. The way that they, they, they uh, say that it works is one was a name for being a priest and the other one was as the father name, his, his house name. I don't know if that's the accurate statement. But Kevin, if you would go back to verse 1. It says, He was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, uh, this also is known as Mount Sinai. What I love about Horeb is, is like one commentator said, uh, it's kind of a cool image. The, the Windy City, which would be what city, you guys? Chicago. If I said the Big Apple. New York. If I said the Big D. Dallas. Dallas, okay. They have these nicknames. It's a, kind of the same with Horeb. Horeb had, uh, it's almost had this, this nickname of a desolate place, which is talking about the mountain of God, which is Mount Sinai. If you would, Kevin, let's keep going to verse 2. Here I am in, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. So here you have Moses. <laughs> He's just taking care of the sheep. In the middle of this is there, there's a bush, and we know, we've heard this in Israel before, uh, seeing a, a bush on fire, actually in that environment, at any point they could just light on fire. The uncommon part was as Moses looked, he saw that the bush was on fire but was not consumed. That was the uncommon part. Bushes would catch on fire all the time out there in the wilderness. So fire has this, this mentality of destruction. So when Moses sees this bush not being destroyed, he's kind of perplexed by this. But then there's also another image of uh, sometimes when a fire is there, it, it purifies. The role of a fire is to bring about purification. In Isaiah 6, I love this image. Just go to verse 1, Kevin, really, if you would. But in Isaiah 6, it has this mentality with the major prophet, okay? In that year, King Uzziah died. In fact, let me go here real quick, Kevin. I want to make sure, I don't want, to, want you to read everything here. 
Yeah, in verse uh, 6, Kevin, if you would. Well, let's start in verse 5. Talking about this purification. Woe is me, for I am, I am ruined because of a man of unclean lips and, li- and live among a people of unclean lips. And because my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts, now in verse 6, it says, The one of the seraphim flew to me, and in his hand was a glowing coal, which you know that means it's hot, it's on fire, like it's burning, that he had taken from the altar with tongs. <laughs> Isn't that a cool image? Wait till we get to this, you guys, in Isaiah. He touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your wickedness is removed and your sin is atoned for. A seraphim with tongs and a coal comes in and puts it to my mouth. Purification takes place through fire. And the major prophet received, check this out, atonement for his sin. All throughout the Old Testament, you have these sacrifices of these purifications, these offerings. Like there's so much here with the fire. Destruction and it purifies. The other one I want to really uh, uh, make everybody know is presence. Is that when you see fire, ooh, guys, (laughs) fire. Is it ready? Oh, that's some fire. Hebrews 12, 27. Let's start in 28. Here we go. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us hold on to grace. By it we may serve God acceptably with reverence and awe. And then it goes to verse 29. For our God is a consuming fire. Now, all right. Here's here's a destruction, purification, and presence. Now, in verse 4, when the Lord saw that Moses had gone, he had gone out, he showed interest that he went out to look. God called him out to him from the bush. (laughs) The bush talked to him. Moses, Moses. And we know, you guys, after studying Genesis, anytime you see the same name twice, you're going to see this incredible response of, here I am. It's a pretty cool verse. And then in verse 5, he says, hold on. (laughs) Don't come closer. He said, remove the sandals from your feet for the place where you're standing is holy ground. So he gives him a very clear instruction. By the way, you're, you're going to be in my presence. I want to make sure you recognize this is not normal. In verse 6, then the burning bush continued to speak at this time. Then he continued, and this is, he identified himself. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And why this is important, you guys, is you remember very clearly in Exodus 2, the people were complaining, the people were whining, they're groaning, they're moaning. God, when is this going to stop? And it says in Numbers, he hears their cries. And he says, I am with you. I remember my covenant. I remember my promise. Moses, I am the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm here. You guys, this hasn't happened since the last time Jacob had an encounter in, in, in the, at the end of Genesis. This revelation, God is now speaking again, and you're just like, praise the Lord. And so, Kevin, if you would, can you go back here for me? It says in verse 7, God responds. After Moses is hiding from, he's afraid to look, God responds in 7 through 12. And you know what he says? You know basically what he says for the next four verses? Deliverance is coming. I've heard your prayers. I've heard your people's prayers. And oh, by the way, I'm getting you ready to bring about deliverance. Verse 7, the Lord said, I've observed the misery of my people in Egypt, and I've heard them crying out because of their oppressors, and I know about their sufferings. I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from the land, remember, the land of Egypt, to a good and spacious land. And if you were with us a couple days ago, to a land flowing with milk and honey, prosperity, fruitfulness, and the territory of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, and Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Like the territory of these guys, we're going we're gonna to just, we're going to take it and it's going to be given to you. And God continues to describe to Moses in this burning bush discussion, the Israelites cry for help has come to me. And I've also seen, I'm in verse 9, the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Verse 10, he wraps up, therefore go. <laughs> Remember, he's got his sandals off. He's talking to a burning bush. I want you to go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh. Remember the, the people that you left, you killed one of them, so that you may lead my people. Whew. The Israelites out of Egypt. Moses comes up with five excuses 
of why he doesn't think he can do this. I'm only going to get into two today because the other three start in Exodus 4 and on. But I want to give you two of them. I love what Nelson's commentary says. The first one is, you know what, number, the number one excuse that Moses gives right away? Oh, by the way, I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody. Moses asked God in verse 11, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? <laughs> and Moses' response was not praising the Lord. It wasn't like, yes, thank you. Instead, one commentator, Wiersbe, says, he argued with the Lord to escape the divine call to rescue Israel from slavery. This is what he wanted all of his life, and all of a sudden, in fact, even at one point, he killed somebody to start bringing about freedom. And now God says, I'm going to do it. And he's like, no, thank you. One commentator says he, he acted like a horse in killing somebody. He went ahead and now he's acting like a stubborn mule. No, thanks. It's a crazy picture, but he says, I'm nobody. In fact, God, I love God. I love God. He answers in verse 12, uh, I'll certainly be with you. And this will be the sign to you that I've sent you. When you bring the people out of er Egypt, you will all worship God at this mountain. Okay, fine. God, all right. I hear your response, Moses says. But let's go to one more excuse that he comes up with. Number two excuse. Um, God, I don't know your name. I love this one. Oh, God, I'm a nobody, but... Can you clarify, please? I don't know your name. Then Moses said, if I go to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what's his name? Uh, what am I supposed to tell them? <laughs> I love the practicalness. I promise you, you and I, maybe you guys wouldn't. I would. If I'm at a burning bush and I'd be like, uh, who am I talking to? Yes, God, but what should I tell him? Who should, who should I say sent me? And God replied to Moses, you tell them, I am who I am. This is what I, you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I feel like there's a mic drop somewhere right now. Boom. That's it. That's all you need to know. In other words, I am who I am. It represents like God will always be with us. God always is with us. And God will always be with us down the road. He was, he is, and he will be. That's the mentality of I am. And just so you need to know, God also said to Moses, say this to the Israelites in verse 15, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Don't you love you guys? 400 years later, he's still reminding them of his promises. They've sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered in every generation. It doesn't just stop. And then in verse 16, scripture continues. Go, I want you to assemble all the elders of Israel and say to them, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, and don't you love how he reiterates the Moses over and over? I feel like we're in the book of Genesis again. The God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me in a burning bush and said, I paid close attention to you and to what has been done to you in Egypt. He's connecting with them. And he says in verse 17, and I've promised you that I'll bring you up from the misery of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land that's flowing with milk and honey. It's a real place, but we got to actually engage these people. And in verse 18, the scripture says, they will listen to what you say, the elders, then you, along with the elders of Israel. You got to go to the king of Egypt, and I want you to say to him, Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Now, please let us go on a three-day trip into the wilderness so that we may sacrifice to Yahweh our God. I love this because it, later on in Exodus 7, it talks about how they wanted to worship God on a neutral site so that they can worship in purity. So they wanted just to go worship in purity away from this land, away from this darkness. And in verse 19, he says, however, I know that the king of Egypt won't allow you to do this <laughs> unless he is forced by a strong hand. So then he begins to unfold Moses' plan. You're going to get the elders. You're going to go ask for a three-day trip. They're going to say no, but I'm going to come in. In verse 20, he says, I'm going to stretch out my hand. I'm going to strike Egypt with all my miracles that I will perform in it. These miracles. You guys, how many plagues are we going to get into? Ten plagues. I'm going to show up in a radical way. And after that, he'll let you go. And I will give these people such favor in the sight of the Egyptians that when you go, oh, by the way, you're not going to go empty handed. I have this image of that. Remember, they had wagons full of stuff when they came into Egypt. I feel like it's the same mentality when you leave. 
you're not going to leave empty handed. And then in verse 22, to wrap this up before we get into kind of really the, the crux of the whole thing, each woman's going to ask her neighbor and any woman staying in her house for silver and gold jewelry and clothing, and you'll put them on your sons and daughters. So you will plunder the Egyptians. God's going to show up. He's going to deliver the Israelites, the Hebrews from the Egyptians. And guess who he's going to use? Moses. Or in Hebrew, you can say Moishi. What I love is, is that Moses is writing this. He says, I'm a nobody. I don't know your name, but God says, don't worry. I will always be with you. I am. When I hear this phrase, I am. Just like when I hear the fear of the Lord is beginning of the wisdom, I feel like, and then it says in the New Testament that, that Jesus is God's wisdom. Jesus talks about being I am as well. And so in, in uh, I'm just going to write these I am statements because I think it's, it's pretty powerful. Here you have in Exodus uh, in Exodus, his very first time he said, I am, would have been in Exodus, what, Exodus 3, Exodus 3, verse 14, thanks. So this is the basis of the deliverer. He says, I am who I am. I'm going to use you. <laughs> I'm sending you to bring about deliverance. And then Jesus gives different examples of the I am. Jesus says in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Jesus, Jesus continues to bring a shock factor. And I love this one. Jesus says in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. And number three, he says, I am, Kevin, if you want to go to John 10, verse 7, I am the door of the sheep. Started in Exodus 3, 14 when we first heard the I am's, but now Jesus begins to unfold. Oh, by the way, that's me as well. I assure you, I am the door of the sheep. Number five, he says, I am the good shepherd in John 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. It's crazy as it continues on. You got three more in number five. Kevin, if you would, John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Number six, Jesus continues in John 14, 6, I am the way the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. Oops, I guess I wasn't putting that on the, all the others. And then number seven, in John 15, 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine. You know, I wrestled with putting all of these here, but when I think of the burning bush and the I am, I actually believe, you ready for this one? Jesus was present at the burning bush. It's kind of a crazy statement, but why not? If Jesus says, I was before Abraham, if he says, I was there at the very beginning, and then he says at the very end in John, and he says, oh, by the way, I am, I actually believe Jesus is saying, that was me. So I think one other one you could add is, I am the burning bush, and my presence never goes out. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he doesn't forget what he's told his people. All right, guys, we'll, we'll talk to you tomorrow as we continue to dig into the book of Exodus written by Moses. Thanks.